Hello, everybody. My name's Mark Cocker. I'm an author and naturalist, and I'm also uh, a good friend of the person that I'm introducing today. Patrick Barkham is a highly distinguished Guardian journalist on natural history. He's also um, a prize-winning author. He's written famously uh, The Butterfly Islands, Islander, Badger Lands, and now a new book called Wild Child Coming Home to Nature, which is full of Patrick's characteristic, characteristic leisurely, very skillful prose while getting across really important uh, political messages. So it's a great pleasure to welcome you, Patrick. Thanks, Mark. It's lovely to be chatting in the, in the virtual world that we find ourselves. And you have some nice pictures behind you of the family and, and to show that it is a real home, whereas mine's horrible <laughs> plastic. Fine. Anyway, Patrick, tell us a little bit about, because your previous works have been uh, always in your work, there is an exploration of the relationship between humans and nature. Um, and I would say this is perhaps the most, while having the same kind of easy elegance in the prose, there's a bit more political punch in it. Just tell us a little bit about where the book arose, what motivated you, etc. Um, yeah, sure. Like like every pet parent, you know, having children is a life changing event, and it it, it soon became clear to me after I had. Um, twins with my wife Lisa eight years ago that, that their childhood was going to be very different from my own and um, we're growing up in sort of edge of a large urban village in Norfolk which is a similar place to where I grew up as a kid and um, in the 80s and early 90s I had so much more freedom than my children will enjoy and so I wanted to explore that and also well yeah it's becoming increasingly clear isn't it that we as if we're writing sort of about nature and wildlife that we can't just celebrate it and that we are in the midst of a huge global environmental crisis and you know with climate change but I think also that obviously the mass extinction and loss of biodiversity and so I wanted to sort of not shy away from those issues and I, I guess I, I don't think it's possible to tackle those two big global challenges unless we reconfigure our relationship with nature and, and and that begins with the next generation as as obviously we're responsible but it it begins with the next generation too and and they've they've got to be much better custodians than than, than we have proven i mean the interesting thing for me is do you i mean did you just just tell us a little bit about the kind of childhood encounter which you yourself had how, how far could you roam into the countryside was your childhood essentially one where you were outdoors <laughs> you know just tell us a little bit about that yeah so i mean the the, the pattern across three generations of barkhams if you like is exactly the same as probably it is for most people in in the in the wealthy western world at least and so my dad grew up in somerset and he would as seven years old he would roam completely on his own into the countryside and be gone for most of the day and he'd be uh, looking in birds nests and catching butterflies and burrowing tunnels into haystacks and doing some fairly hazardous things you know it, it wasn't uh, the 50s childhood was not necessarily idyllic. A lot of older people you talked to about their childhood experiences in the countryside talk about there being a lot of flashes, for example, back in those days, you know. So, uh, you know, it, it, it wasn't an idyll. And then me in the 80s, I think uh, probably the last generation of children who really roamed free, and I grew up next door to a common, and me and my little mate would be on the common unaccompanied by adults when we were sort of eight or nine. When I was nine or ten, I was cycling three miles to primary school on my own. Not not daily, but you know it was something that you do in summer. So I, I had a sort of degree of freedom, and now suddenly, today's children, my children, don't go anywhere without adult supervision. And I hadn't really realised that my twins are now eight, and they've never been anywhere without the presence of adults nearby supervising them. And some of this is rational; it's to do the massive growth in traffic. But some of it is irrational. There's a kind of um, ethic of good parenting now where a good parenting is synonymous with perpetual supervision 
and we cannot lose sight of our children or we're bad parents and, and so that's that's come into play and children have everything organized for them these days it's just activity organized activity it's all led by adults it's all organized and i think that's catastrophic actually for not just children's relationship with nature and ability to form intimate relationships with nature but it's catastrophic for their um, independence and their creativity as well as their mental health and physical well-being Yes, it's interesting. I mean, how far is this then a book about the psychology of the parent uh, uh, as it is about how we liberate children? I mean, for example, just one statistic I think that you give or, or that was in um, that, that I read recently, one hundredth of a single one percent is the number of children that are at risk or go missing because of strangers. So the risk is truly, truly, absolutely minimal. And yet, and yet the issue of stranger danger is probably seared into the imaginations of every modern child. How do we, can we even begin to mm. reverse those psychological manacles which we placed upon ourselves and on our children? Yeah, I, uh, it's a good question, and I don't think it's easy at all. And there's the psychological element, but I think it would become easier to challenge that if structurally society was different. But the, this requires really radical change. And I think, in terms of the structures I'm talking about, it's it's things like the being a society beyond the nuclear family. And, and lockdowns intensified all these social trends. And one is this sort of um, constriction into the nuclear family. And, and this idea that um, other responsible adults in my village cannot tell off my children or look after them or, or oversee them is, is, is a kind of pernicious thing. And somehow we need to get um, a society that is broader than the nuclear family again, build that back up so that there can be supervision of children by people who aren't just parents and aren't mm. formally in, in charge of. So children are kind of overseen as they move freely through a, a, an urban street or a, or a village or a, or a village within a big city. And so there's that sort of we're all somehow taking responsibility again for, for, for giving some freedom to our children. It also requires us to radically rethink our roads. Our roads are public highways. They weren't built for cars and we have completely um, drawn back and allowed the car and the rights of the adult motorist to take precedent over the rights of children. Um, we've, uh, this really struck me, the sociologist Mayor Hillman did some work on this and I hadn't considered it before until he said, rather than removing um, danger from um, our children, we've removed our children from danger. He was talking about the roads. And so we need to reconfigure how our roads are thought of. Uh, yeah. to, as, as a starting point, why couldn't we have every Sunday, one Sunday a month, have no traffic, no one using their cars apart from key workers. And so you have to have a kind of license to use your car that day. And we all, all as drivers voluntarily give up car use for a day to enable our streets to be used more freely by cyclists and pedestrians and so on. Just during lockdown, you know, this is a great moment of possibility and it's a great, um, it could be a, you know, there's no reason not to be optimistic right now in terms of how we've seen how radically um, and quickly we can change our society if we need to. And, and lots of us don't want to go back. I think most of us, poll show, don't want to go back to the way things were. So why don't we start by um, having lockdown levels of traffic on our roads for at least a portion, you know, I mean, ideally every weekend. Yeah. Sunday. I mean, that, that statistic that you, or, or that, that quote from the sociologist, I forget his name, but- Maya Hillman, yeah. Maya Hillman, such a telling one, isn't it, that we've, we, we've, we've, we've privileged the car. The car is the, is the, is the central motif of modern society and, and really has been hugely destructive of parts of human experience, just walking. I mean, we privilege everything, in fact. In, I live in Derbyshire where we privilege cycling over walking. You know, everybody who's on two wheels or, or four wheels is given priority over the person that's the pedestrian. And that seems to me to reverse what should be the norms. It also strikes me that what you're calling for in our parenting is a model that's very central to the hearts of African life, where famously it's said in Africa that it takes a whole village to, to raise a child. 
and that collective responsibility. Do you think those things are, could we recover those things? I mean, you talk about lockdown, perhaps we need a crisis to bring about the kind of societal change that would improve our lives because there are real deficits for children when they don't have access to nature. Do you want to say a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I, I mean, thank you for bringing that up too, because I, I do think lockdown, I've lost count of the number of people who've said to me, and I, I've done this, um, gone, wow, I discovered a footpath I never knew existed, you know, within 500 yards of home, or I've discovered this amazing little bit of green space. And um, it, it does, but it's been very clear in lockdown that access to green space isn't equal. And uh, um, poorer societies and um, ethnic minority societies tend to have less access to green space than uh, more wealthy places. There's, there's some good stats on this. And we saw places like the whole of Middlesbrough shut every park, you know, and, and Middlesbrough relatively deprived in many places. There's 2.7 million people in Britain don't have green public green space within 10 minutes walk of their home. And I do think we're an urban people now, 83% of us in Britain live in what's classified as an urban area. And it, it should be seen as a modern day human right, like access to healthcare and free schooling. Although, of course, we don't have universal free schooling at the moment either. Um, but that's another point. Um, and uh, to access to green space should be considered a universal human right. And, and this could be a really positive thing that the government did to, um, as part of the post-coronavirus rebuilding of society. You know, national parks, as, as, as you know from your brilliant Our Place and your, your telling of the history of conservation across the 20th century, national parks were drawn up in the, in the depths of the Second World War. And right now we should be drawing up plans for a, a new generation of urban green spaces to give everyone that high quality green space within within 10 you know within 10 minutes walk of home within a kilometer of, of 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 home it should be something for everyone yes i mean i'm reminded very much and um of your work for the green party for caroline lucas we were jointly authors of a new deal for nature and some of the ideas that you brought to the table were absolutely fantastic about how we could revolutionize our urban spaces uh, I mean, and some of the, uh, just tell us a little bit about some of the ideas which you placed in that document, but which would, yes, as transform the lives. Because of course, middle class people by and large own the countryside. If we look at land ownership or house ownership, even second home ownership in places like the Lake District or the North Norfolk coast, which is familiar to you, these places have been hoovered up by the middle classes and it's in, and as we've seen with lockdown and with coronavirus it is essentially the the, the less um, uh, wealthy people who have suffered most in these circumstances just say a little bit about the ideas which you came up with well i i mean most obviously there's uh, you know if if we sort of reconfigure our, our sense of, of nature I, I, I think it requires us to sort of think again doesn't it about um, what's a wild place and what's worth saving and, and obviously there's these sites of special scientific interest that are very important and but they, they tend to be a long way from 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 cities and it's it's reconfiguring um, ideas of, of of nature and the wild and the fact that our, our cities can be really good places for nature and could be so much better places for nature and there's really modest things you could do just to ensure that every new development you know of more than five houses comes with a with a with a pond you know and comes with some publicly accessible green space and that even high density flats in London you you, you can have these swales these um, urban um, environmentally friendly drainage systems that, that enable you to have green space close to them. It's, it's sort of bringing, bringing that into our built environment. We, we should be having, you know, swift boxes and sparrow boxes integrally built to every, every new home so that we can grow up with these birds in our eaves. We can grow up with an intimate relationship with other species and um, in terms of education there's a huge amount we could do with with proper financial support there's been a real grassroots movement in education without any help from government over the last 30 years to create forest schools and many ordinary state primary schools my local state primary school here in Hoverton does it provide forest schools which is kind of free play in a wildish setting 
and uh, with a bit more help you know ev every school could have that I know urban schools often I know them well the old Victorian schools with only playgrounds you can still have green space and wildness in a even in a playground in the middle of London and we could have lessons outdoors but that requires more training for teachers to enable even conventional lessons you can I've been in lessons where children have been discussing poetry you know underneath a tree and it's a poem about a tree and it's so much more powerful when it's there and, and yeah, yeah. yeah experiential learning rather than just having it hammered into you while your bum is on a seat in a classroom but you know changes in education this isn't to criticize schools i think schools are doing heroically with very few resources but it's about resources and it's about what we as a society are willing to fund and um, we would certainly reduce the long-term um, bill on, on the NHS and, and on the health system if we were to bring up a generation of healthier children. Um, yes, I, I was very struck by some of the things. I mean, I just wanted to briefly bring in, sorry to interrupt you. Um, yeah. Some of the things you talk about as a consequence, I mean, it, here we are saying, this is what we need. Let's perhaps explore why it's so necessary for children to have these kinds of experiences. I mean, you list the fact that one in five of school children are now clinically obese. I think um, a very, very high percentage of children since 2010 claim that they're, that they're less happy than they were, that they have more incidents, one in eight of people under 19 has mental illness. But the most telling thing for me was that um, our education system, this kind of force feeding, commodified version of, of learning that was measured by stats, etc., was leading to higher IQs in our children. But over the last 20 years, an American study says that our children are less emotionally expressive, less energetic, less talkative, less verbally expressive, less humorous, less imaginative, less unconventional, less lively and passionate, less perceptive, and less able to link things which seem separate, but are actually connected. So tell us a little bit more about why nature is so important to the whole development of the, of the young person. Yeah, that's. I'm. I'm glad you brought up that. That that quote is an incredibly powerful one from an American researcher looking at mm. that decline in creativity among mm. children. And it's yeah, that's that's ma a, a, a massive a massive deal. I think I don't I don't wish to turn this into a pretentious discussion about nature writing, but I've only recently started to think about my own writing, and I'm not as creative a writer as I would like to be. I've never managed to write a novel. But um, when I think about the origins of my creative process and, and uh, when I have a good idea and where it comes from, and it, it's entirely, I think, on reflection, related to my childhood and the childhood that my parents gave me and not my formal education and not what I've done since. And um, it's also related to time in nature time outdoors time and and you you've written mark very beautifully about about this and about how um how as a naturalist you 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 become an observer of, of of small things and how that informs your writing too but i observe it in my own children that when they've had a day at, at forest school they go once a week to this um lovely forest school called dandelion in in mid norfolk and um, they come home and their and their play is more imaginative and more creative and um, and after a after a day in the woods you know i mean we all feel better but i do think it, um, the statistical it, data that wood bathing is actually very very positive for the neuron development of of the of the human neurological system isn't it yeah yeah yeah, I mean, there's clearly and there's and there's some good neuroscience about, um, you know, really um, sort of solid direct evidence of, of how our brain sort of changes the way it works when it's in green spaces. But um, yeah, just from from a more amorphous kind of point of view of where does creative thinking come from? It comes from children being um, self-directed and being able to pray for play freely and explore freely and learn freely and you can't do that in a small classroom with 30 children 
you, you, you simply can't. You probably can do it in some indoor settings. I'm not, I'm not dismissing the great indoors as, as being worthless to a child's development, because clearly if a child spends a lot of time in museums and libraries and so forth, they're going to be a pretty amazing person. But uh, I, I, it's that being self-directed, free play outdoors. I think the greatest one of the greatest gifts obviously apart from apart from love and food and shelter that we as parents can give our children is is free play outdoors you know it, it's not us as parents being mentors and teaching and directing and pointing out things to our children it's it's letting children form their own relationships with other species and with other places because of course the other point to make is that um nature was not it was our entire environment the rest of the living system of which we are part was the was both the school the education process the spiritual environment the cathedral the church the, everything that about humans was def, was defined by its relationship with the rest of the living planet and that has changed in the last 10 generations but it seems to me before i go on to the unsung hero of this book which is your your wonderful daughter esme and i see that on your zoom thing it says lisa really it should, should be yeah. esme i'm talking to yeah. because yeah she yeah. also inspired this book she you you draw on her inspirational responses to nature yeah i mean it was fascinating uh, having twins because we had uh, non-identical girls and Millie and Esme and right from the first moment their their reactions to the same things were so different and uh, from six months old Esme was exploring the world by taste uh, this is apparently quite normal amongst babies and stuffing soil and moss into her mouth she was a great moss eater and from a very young age she was transfixed by movement and pointing at wood pigeons outside our um, we lived at the time overlooking an old cemetery. Old cemeteries are, are fantastic places for wildlife in, in, in... I know that cemetery very yeah. well. I found Firecrest and Pied Flycatcher in that cemetery. Have you? <laughs> I mean, Earlham Cemetery, this is in West Norwich, is a fantastic yes. place. It's local um, yeah. wildlife site too. Um, and uh, yeah, Esme just had a clear need to be in the natural world. And lots of people say, oh, well, you know, I'm into nature, so of course she's gonna be following my example or whatever. But it was really, I was trying to be quite child-led about things as, um, well, now as uh, at any point being a parent. And it was really led by her. And um, she's a certain kind of nature person too. She, and and it, it, it took me a longer, time to realize that Millie defines herself you know twins define themselves differently she defines herself as a sort of indoor person who likes arts and crafts and so forth but Millie actually gets as much from being in nature and outdoor places as 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 Esme but she doesn't sort of directly celebrate it in the same way she's kind of collecting things and making things and sort of responding more quietly to it Esme's like a hunter I mean she would in another era she would be hunting wolves and you know I mean she she wants to catch stuff and, and have it as pets and possess it. And um, then, you know, the stimulation that comes from being outdoors and seeing stuff is, is what, what moves her and drives her. And, and you know, we've had, some, we've had some mishaps and she's killed a few things that she shouldn't have killed by accident. And she's been mortified by that. But, but through allowing her to have hands-on experiences, I mean, she, we, we dug a little pond in our garden. We're next door to an industrial estate, so we're nowhere special. And within two months, a grass snake appeared in the pond. And then the next moment I was looking outside and Esme was there grabbing the snake and holding it up. Um, snake was fine. And the, you know, the world of snakes had gained a fan for life. You know? So it's that, the, the hands-on experiences are so important. And um, uh, Esme's handling of, of wild things now is much better than my own actually just yesterday this is a lovely role reversal we're, we're we're still in lockdown at the time that we're speaking here and um yesterday so my kids were being educated at home yesterday and i was working and i got a call from the head teacher of our local school and i thought oh no i'm in trouble you know you think when you get a call from the head teacher you're in trouble she said we've got a snake we're a bit worried we're not sure what it is C could you come in and i did -de it so me and millie and esme rushed into school um and Esme took a half second look at it, it was a baby, and she just went, grass snake, 
and of course she was right and um and so um esme was able to release it back into the wood pile from whence it came and the school didn't have to worry about it being an adder um and then we went back home to carry on with our schooling it was a it was a nice reversal but... es esme the snake wrangler i mean one yeah. of that's a very interesting thing you know you talked about your father john balcom who's a distinguished ecologist himself but and and I recall in my own childhood, there has to be, to some extent, I've written about this in the past, uh, an element of destructiveness in our relationship with nature. I mean, I remember vividly collecting eggs and doing things which are now illegal and frowned upon and I would never, never dream of doing. But somehow those testing of the boundaries as Esme has explored and killed things perhaps, is a necessary part, but it's also a difficult part to mediate. Do you not think? Yeah, it is. It is difficult, and um, yeah, it, it. You know, I've obviously I've tried to stop things, and and there was one time Esme poked a a, a, a collared dove a collared dove nest because she was so desperate to hold the chick, and the chick fell out of the nest and and died, and we both felt terrible about that, and. Um, conducted a little funeral and so on. It does, um, and I'm not advocating killing things for a minute. And and we, you know, I try and prevent them, but I'm always sort of shouting, "Careful!" But you know, after a few mistakes, you also learn about life and death as soon as you're engaged with nature. And and I do think we're, you know, perhaps less so now with coronavirus. But as a whole society, we're terrified of death. We're shielded from it. We keep it away from ourselves. And that starts right at childhood. And um, you know, and, and in childhood, we don't see dead things. We don't know where our food comes from and so forth. And so all, all these issues are, are solved by having a more intimate relationship with the wild world and, and witnessing death, witnessing the consequences of it, the sadness of it and, and why we want to, you know, keep things alive, why we want to not, not kill things. You know, you, you, you only discover that by seeing a dead thing, don't you? Seeing the sadness of a, of a, of a dead animal. Absolutely, it frames our experience for the rest of our lives. My memories of visiting a robin's nest not 200 meters from where I'm talking as a child and seeing it and being so mesmerized to see it so often that I eventually forced the birds to abandon the nest. Not only stays with me as an experience of my intense love and passion for nature, but of of the kind of moral challenge which I absorbed and became part of the entire frame of my adult self. Patrick, it's, I think we're running slightly out of time, but it's been a fantastic conversation and life and death and the future of the world and of children is a fantastic place to end. But thank you very much for a really fascinating encounter. And I recommend, couldn't re recommend it more highly, both if you're a, an adult who wants to be part of a responsible society, but also as a parent, there is no better uh, blueprint for how you can rear your children. Patrick, talking about Wild Child, thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.